Uh, but I just want to go over a few of the slides that we missed from yesterday and then start our adventure into learning how to do factoring. Entire screen. Well, I, I promised I'd do this just for, as a backup. I think it's this one, record entire screen, record. Okay. Okay, so let's just summarize what we sort of learned last class. I was sort of bashing numerical approximation for its, uh, well, its, its approximate nature, but that wasn't really fair, right? Numerical analysis and solving things numerically is like totally sufficient. Um, and it's very well understood. NASA only uses 15 digits of pi to navigate the space, right? So you don't even need that much precision in order to do intergalactic travel. And 39 digits of accuracy is adequate to estimate the volume of the universe to within a hydrogen nucleus. Like you don't need, like one may think you need hundreds and hundreds of digits of precision, but in order to do science and physics, you don't. Like 50 digits is more than enough. But the drawback is like instability. We have all of these techniques, but as soon as you start... Um, trying to work with these numbers, it can get a little bit hairy. Why is that? Well, consider that we can't write the square root of two as a decimal. You, you require an infinitely many number of digits and computer memory is finite, right? So thereby any uh, attempt at representing the square root of two using numbers is gonna, gonna fail. This means that any approximation of the square root of two is going to be off somehow, right? So you can take the square root of two to 10 digits and try to square it, you're gonna get 1.999 back. That's certainly not two. If I take 15 digits of the square root of two and square that, you're gonna get a number like 2.00001. If I take 20 digits, which is already more than the number of digits that NASA uses to navigate the space, you get 2.000 all zeros. So why isn't that third option okay? What is inadequate about the third option that I wrote here? Is it two? How many zeros does two the integer have after its decimal? An infinite number of zeros, right? This just happens to, who, who knows? Maybe the next digit after this one was six or something like that. So it's some of the zeros, but not all of them, right? So you're, you're never going to be able to represent simple objects like fractions and irrational numbers using a numerical system. The way that we can regard this um, numerical instability is by regarding float not as a number, but like a range, right? So every number with error can be, you're just like saying, I know the answer is in this interval somewhere uniformly. And what happens if you take an interval and you add another interval interval to it. Well, you get a new interval, which is wider, right? So this is the problem with numerical calculation. Um, we have this notion of uh, relative error and absolute error, and absolute error can get really overwhelming. So this, if you add two intervals together, the interval gets wider. So what is the purpose of reporting back? Like the, the, the person's height is uh, 1.286438 meters plus minus a kilometer. Like that, that is a pointless answer to report back, right? So what we need to be able to do is keep these intervals um, uh, as narrow as possible. What do we, we talked a lot about Gaussian elimination yesterday. What do we do in Gaussian el elimination primarily? I'm saying adding floating numbers is bad. What do we do in Gaussian elimination? Add again and again and again and again and again, right? So Gaussian elimination is one of the the most ill-equipped natural algorithms for putting floats in it because the thing that you need to do all the time is add, right? And so this means your answers are just going to get wider and wider, or the intervals where your answer lies is going to get wider and wider and wider. It's okay to multiply because if you multiply a small error by small error, it gets smaller. That's the nature of numbers that are less than one. And then the other thing I did yesterday is say how great symbolic computation was. And no one sort of asked the question, if symbolic computation is so great, why isn't it the thing that we're always using? And it's because I didn't tell you about what drawback symbolic computation has. If I'm saying we need arbitrarily large integers, how many numbers do I need to represent arbitrarily large integers? Well, all of them. And that's not something that we can do with a computer that has finite memory. So although I can represent a fraction like a third, um, my symbolic systems are gonna require integers that are like so big, Right? We, need, we need to start using all of these other techniques that you learned. Like you did a little bit of Karatsuba's algorithm before this. Did you guys? You didn't talk about how to multiply huge integers together? 
oh, I must be having a stroke or something. Um, okay, I can tell you a little bit about Karatsuba's algorithm. Um, but in any case, right, uh, if you're working with rational numbers, like so in symbolic systems, we do actually get to use fractions. You can't have a number like A over B. But as you keep working with fractions, if they don't reduce, your fractions are just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Right. So the problem in numerical analysis is that our intervals that represent the answer get wider and wider and wider. And the problem in symbolic computation is that the fractions that we require to represent something um, symbolically and exactly, those fractions are going to get enormous. Right. And that that's a problem. So how do we how do we overcome this problem? Has anyone heard of the Chinese remainder theorem? Okay, anyone who has taken number theory surely has been shown this technique. I'll just go over it uh, sort of again. So it's the game that we play is that I have a secret number. The secret number is called N, right? And you get to ask me what the remainder of that number is for any um, divisions that you want, right? So you can say, what is the remainder of N mod P? And I say, it's A. And you say, okay, what is the remainder of N mod Q? And I say, it's B. And the game is, if um, can you then, after asking these questions, reconstruct the original number? So can you get the original number back knowing only its images um, mod a bunch of stuff? And the answer is yes. I'll show you how to do this uh, precisely. Uh, but what does this mean exactly? Well, first of all, uh, we don't have to work with fractions. That is one big benefit. Right? So working with fractions is kind of a pain because they require reduction steps. Like you can either let them expand and not reduce them, in which case they get huge, or you occasionally have to take a GCD to reduce them, which is expensive. Right? So working with fractions is actually not that great, but we're going to restrict ourselves to working uh, in residue classes of prime characteristics. So we're gonna restrict ourselves to using like a finite many of the integers. So one third is the same thing as two mod five because the inverse of three mod five is two. And we'll talk about this a lot more, right? So you don't see this as a fraction. You see this as the inverse of inverse of three. Yeah. Would you say the like in the two plus one two is that the equation like the equation is five? Yeah, so I looked this up yesterday. What I mean by residue class is what uh, other people call I just looked this up. Like the canonical representation, you know how you can have an equivalence class? The, the thing in the equivalence class is called, a, we somehow is also called a residue class. And the things that we're interested in is like the canonical rep represent representatives of the things in that class. So um, if I can have a residue class of um, five numbers and that's zero, one, two, three, four, five. Um, so if I say residue class, you can just hear that as like a quotient ring or, um, yeah, what else can we? Well, anyway, just let's I'll tell you what I define a residue class to be, and then we'll just use that as the definition. Okay, so now, if we work um, in a residue class, by which I mean we're going to work mod p for some prime, this means we don't actually have to work with fractions. So the idea is that we're going to um, take a look at our we want we want to accomplish some task. And we're going to do that task mod two, mod three, mod five, mod seven, mod 11, mod enough, right? And I'm going to give you some boundary where we have to do this and then use Chinese remainder theorem to like reconstruct the answer, right? It's about the same as the theorem. Why do you say it's unique? Like if I just add EQ to N, so can I get a number which is really just X twice? Yeah, I think I probably have to have a bound boundary condition here. So this is not the precise statement. These are like, this is the intro slides before I really like, I'm trying to give you a very overhead look. So these are not the precise statements. Let's, the, my course notes will have the precise statements, but I think it's unique. Uh, uh, yeah, op, yeah, mod PQ, right? But then I can actually give you uh, a sufficient condition saying the product of your primes have to exceed this number in order for it to be unique among like the integers proper. But you are correct. There is a missing missing condition here. Okay, so that's the first thing. We're gonna use Chinese remainder theorem to eliminate the like having to use fractions, which is great. And it's also way easier to work mod P, right? Than it is to work over the regular integers. So there are uh, Chinese remainder theorem based algorithms for doing polynomial arithmetic. So this is like Karasupa-like, I guess. So 
instead of finding the product of two polynomials, uh, traditionally, like just by sort of saying, okay, do X cubed to multiply all by G and then add that to two X squared. What I can do instead is like a, an interpolation type of strategy. I hope that's what I've, I've put here. Oh, okay. So this one, I just say the I can compute the product mod three. I can compute the product mod seven. I can compute the product mod 11. And then using the Chinese remainder theorem, I can actually construct the product over like the integers generally, right? So this is how we're going to avoid using huge integers or huge fractions, right? By way of this Chinese remainder theorem. Um, we can also um, avoid arithmetic by doing interpolation. If I give you three points, how many curves go through that? How many polynomials go through three points on the plane? One, there's exactly one parabola that goes through three points on the plane. If I give you two points, there's exactly one line that goes through those two points. So this means instead of doing F times G, why don't we just evaluate F at a point, evaluate G at a point. We know that the product of those evaluations is going to be the um, evaluation of the product. So if I know that F here is degree three and G has degree two, what do we expect their product to be? Like what degree will their product have at most? Yeah, five. So if I find six evaluation points and then interpolate, that has to be their product. And that's way faster than doing just multiplication naturally, right? So these interpolation algorithms, we get a lot of leverage out of them. Right? And sort of, this is sort of carrot soup alike. And so you don't necessarily have to do all of the arithmetic tr traditionally. And in fact, we don't. Uh, we talked a lot about encoding algebraic numbers, but uh, effectively to remind everyone, the, the basic, uh, the atomic number or unit that we're using in a symbolic system is that of algebraic numbers, right? So we don't really use numbers, but we have polynomials and the numbers are the roots of those polynomials, right? So we can get fancy algebraic numbers like that. Uh, so the question is, if I have an algebraic number and I have a polynomial, how do I then evaluate that polynomial at that algebraic number if it's if it's sort of trapped within a polynomial? And I'm going to tell you something that should have been told to you back in high school, but it was deliberately not told to you because it would have made something super easy. So you all learned synthetic division in high school, how to take a polynomial and divide by another polynomial. Did you know that this process is identical to evaluation? So if I take F and I have sort of X cubed minus two X plus two, and I divide out by X minus three, that is equivalent to evaluating the numerator at the roots of the denominator. So to do X cubed minus two X plus two divided by X minus three, all you had to do is evaluate the numerator at three. Would have saved you a hell of a lot of time back in high school, but it's true. You can, you can fact check me on this, just try anything. And this is, this is true generically. Yes, sir. It's still sort of, those are like partial evaluations, right? It, it's, you will, it's definitely going to reduce the degree, right? So somehow an evaluation somehow has been done. I'm not promising the evaluation. Uh, it has returned a number, right? Because the thing that was returned is a polynomial, but we're saying those are numbers, right? So that is an evaluation in some sense is what I'm trying to, uh, trying to sort of convince you of. Right, so instead of doing evaluations, we're doing divisions, right? So if I take X squared and I divide that out by X squared minus two, this is, this is the same thing as saying I'm evaluating X squared at plus minus the square root of two. If I have X squared and I say divide out by X squared plus one, this is the same thing as evaluating X squared at the complex number I, right? So polynomial division is the same thing as evaluation of algebraic numbers. And this is pretty, pretty important. Right, so when we do a lot of these remainders, like they, they're, they're considered a, a type of projection. Okay, so instead of writing remainder, I'm gonna utilize this other style of notation. I hope you guys are familiar with this one. You've used the triple equals. Okay, so instead of, so this is a statement that says X cubed minus two X plus two is congruent to 23 mod X minus three. Yeah. So that's just be saying like X cubed minus two X plus two is, 
Yeah, this is basically the, so this 23 is going to be the remainder. We've lost the quotient, but we can we can reestablish it. I don't think there's much that we're going to need the quotient with. Okay, so that's just a little bit of um, the, the overhead view of what we're going to talk about very specifically today. I'm not going to be able to do, I think I'm only going to do like the, the background algebra uh, and we'll stop as soon as we hit a polynomial. But let's just discuss the project one. Um, so right, what we've given you is a code base, which isn't written that well, uh, because our industry partners keep relaying to us that we need to do a better job teaching our students how to cope with fuzzy specifications. You know what I mean by that? It's, it's it, you know, I need to be able to say, improve this or like do some testing on this, right? That's not a very specific ask. Right. So, but that's essentially what this project is. We've given you a code base and we're like, improve it. Right. Because something that you're going to be doing in industry a lot is working with other people's code, which is badly written. Right. So, uh, that's what we're trying to simulate in this case. So, if you're thinking, Jesus, this is not very well specified, or this code base that we've been given is deficient, it's like, yes, like that. That was almost deliberate that, that we, we have, uh, done so. And the other advantage that you guys have is that this is the third time like this project has been run. So you have you have the you can look at solutions from the last two years. Like we're asking you to do a little bit different, uh, but we do expect you to look at the solutions from previous years if you're like getting stuck. Like I don't that's not going to be cheating in, in our eyes because we, we have asked you to do a little bit a little bit different. So for example with the pretty printer, we want you to get polynomials to print out like this, right? The Julia, Unicode, right? Well, you have Unicode exponents, so let's utilize them, right? See if you can get a polynomial to print out with the Unicode exponents. Now, currently the way that we're storing polynomials in the system, right? I'm saying the polynomial is gonna be the atomic uh, object of our system. So the, its representation is gonna be super important. One of the most basic representations of a polynomial is its dense representation, right? So here's a polynomial. Um, 6x to the power of 5, 5x to the power of 4, so on and so forth. And I can represent that as a, a vector of sorts, right? Where the uh, position, wait, 1 or 0? Julia is 1 indexed, yeah? Okay, so the, the position at 1 is going to be the coefficient of the monomial with 0 degree, right? The position 2 is going to be the coefficient of the monomial with degree 1, Right, so it's, you can find these coefficients really fast. Now, if you wanted to add two polynomials together that had just that dense representation, would that be easy? Vector addition, right? That's it. Um, so if we store our polynomials like this, if they're going to be super easy to encode and super fast to do addition. But what's a deficiency of this dense representation? X to the power of a million minus X. How many wasted positions are we going to have for that dense representation? A million minus two, right? So that's bad, right? We, that, that's a, a, a lot of wasted space. And when we're doing polynomial, uh, when we're doing factorization, something that's going to be very important is to take GCDs with some, that's something that's called a cyclotonic polynomial. And cyclotonic po polynomials are extremely not dense. They're very sparse. Right, so the, the one of the first things we want you to do in your project is dump this representation and use a sparse representation, yeah. right? That is, you're not going to be storing zeros. That's pointless, right? So give some thought. The uh, best data structure to use in this case is a heap. Have you guys heard of a heap before? What are the What are the properties of a heap? Well, constant time access to the top of the heap. And then I think somehow um, like log, like to, to put something in, I think costs log and to reheapify is I think costs a lot. But the point is a heap is something that gives you access to its largest element. Okay, so if I said largest, this implies some type of ordering. What ordering should we order our heap by? The degree of the monomial, right? Because what you need to be fast is leading term. And the leading term is going to be the greatest monomial sorted by degree out of that thing. Because if you think of any of the uh, addition or multiplication algorithms, it's always 
So if I want to add F and G, it's sort of like, well, tell me like, what's the leading term of F and what's the leading term of G? Whatever is bigger, that goes in next. And if they're tied, we'll merge them. But it's always just repeatedly asking for leading term, leading term, leading term, leading term, leading term. Right? So that has to be fast. So in your project, we've actually represented dense polynomials of a vector of terms like this, um, but it's wasteful, right? Because of things like this. So just one of the first things we want you to do is change this representation, right? So you can use, uh, I think last year we're recommending using a pop, but you you can use a heap and you can use the built-in heap for this, yeah. Is it, oh, isn't it already sorted this? Which this? Yeah. No, but I think in your homework, we actually like have the, the zeros are included, unless I misremember. Can anyone fact check me on that one? Um. How can that be? I didn't write because then we'd have to have rewritten all of, none of the arithmetic will work. I'll, I'll have to recheck. Uh, Yanni may have changed something and I, I haven't looked at it, but I'd be surprised if this is what we've given you unless, okay, so I don't know. I'll, I'll stop talking. I'll have to look at this, but last year it wasn't like that. But I, I still do believe that one of your tasks is to create a sparse polynomial data type. We don't need to see this unless you want to see a picture of I, that I took of Wolfram. Oh my God. Yeah, that's Wolfram. That's my master supervisor. And I took this picture, right? I met Wolfram at uh, a conference effectively. Uh, there's a long story. He rage quit our community because two minutes and I'll tell you, tell you the story. So Wolfram has this Mathematica which is like a big symbolic computer algebra package. And Maple's another big one. And every year we have this Isaac conference, the International um, Symposium Symbolic and Algebraic Computation. I used to go every year. And every year there's like a programming competition. And the one, the last time Wolfram came before this, he presumed he won the programming competition because he was Wolfram. Why, why wouldn't he win the programming competition? He was so sure, in fact, that he printed out banners. He didn't win <laughs> and that left a bad taste in his mouth. So um, we managed to get him back by giving him an award. <laughs> we said, come to the Isaac conference and we'll give you an award. He did give a very good talk. He was, he was, um, he was a lovely fellow when I met him. Uh, he's really interesting because he just quit college because he thought it was awful. But then like Caltech just like gave him a PhD. And something that I'm very impressed by was that Richard Feynman was on his PhD committee, right? Richard Feynman is someone like I totally idolize. Um, so I'll let you decide. I've, I've, I've met Wolfram and I've met Terrence Tao. I can't decide who's more famous. Right? So if I were to say who's the most famous mathematician I met, probably one of those two. Okay. Let's now get into the, the meat of this, right? So here's a Julia notebook. Um, I've called in the project and you can see that I can do things like uh, ask, oops, I think I have to do this. I ran, right? Um, this is deficient in a few ways. That's something else that you're going to have to fix. So what's wrong with this? Well, technically speaking, nothing's wrong, but what's suboptimal about printing a monomial like that? <laughs> no, Unicode. But even if Unicode was, um, when you're, if you were to write down like X plus one on paper, would you write one times X to the power of one plus one? What would you write instead? X plus one, right? So we know somehow there's like agreements about not writing units, not writing zeros, right? So that's what your pretty printer has to also do, right? Just think, what would I write down as a human? And that's what the pretty printer should be doing. Um, we also have this zero polynomial. So this is a little bit, whenever you rep like introduce a new like system of like numbers, Something that always becomes a problem is the zero. How many zero polynomials are there? Should be one, right? We want it to be one, but is there anything prohibiting us from creating zero X plus zero or zero X squared plus nothing prohibits it? Unless I think we can get around this by saying, yeah, that the degree has to be greater than zero or something like that. But be careful. This is always a source of bugs when doing zero comparisons on polynomials because you can generate a zero polynomial without it registering a zero if all of the um, terms cancel, which can happen in addi addition, for example. Right. So this is a common error. People, uh, when I'm saying do x plus minus x, they'll put 
zero x into the heap when nothing should be put into the heap. So just be just be careful about that. Okay, so we're gonna go through all of this, which is a background in the basic group ring and field theory that you're gonna to need to understand the statement of factoring. Um, some of you know this very well. And to, to you guys, I don't mean to insult your intelligence because there are other people who don't know any of these, these terms. So um, I'm just gonna assume that everyone doesn't know most of these things because the, the first time I did this, I assumed the opposite and people got quite angry. So in any case, to compute exactly, means we're not going to introduce error uh, do, by doing any type of arithmetic, which isn't true with floats. Our interest is to perform exact arithmetic on rings with efficient algorithms. Right? In particular, we're interested in the ring of integers. Like This is what we're going to be working with because this is what computers can naturally represent. Um, and eventually, by the end of this class, hopefully I'll be able to define what this ring is, and it's the ring of polynomials, right? So the ring of polynomials uh, is, is given by this. It's just all finite sums of, uh, this is called the coefficient of the monomial. This is called the monomial. This is the monomial's degree. And collectively, this is called a term, and the sum of terms are called the polynomial, right? Monomial is one thing. Polynomial are many of those, of those monomials. So let's define all of the um, sort of terminology that we're going to require in order to communicate some of these things. So first, I'm going to define the natural numbers, blackboard n, to be starting from zero, and then one, and then two, and then so forth. Who Who is this irritated already? Who thinks natural numbers start at one? Well, you're wrong. I don't care that it's a cultural thing. You're wrong. Uh, do, do, do we have whole numbers here? So I was taught that there are natural numbers and then whole numbers, and the whole numbers exclude exclude zero. But for us, the natural numbers will include zero. We also have the integers, which are all of the positive natural numbers as well as all of the negative natural numbers. Well, I guess there are no negative natural numbers, but you put a negative in front of all of the natural numbers and union it to the set. And I'm also going to be um, using this blackboard P to designate the set of all primes, excluding two, right? Because two is the even prime and it sort of acts funny. How many primes are there? infinitely many primes. And you could prove this. Anyone who took number theory, this should be something that they taught you, yeah? Because I think all if there are finitely many primes, if you take their product and add one, that's prime, or minus one, that's prime. Um, okay. Who can tell me what a group is? Go ahead. So a set and a binary operation on the set and a binary operation to go through what might be Perfect. That's the perfect definition, even though I now realize that it's uh, been blasted on the projector. But in any case, um, so I give you a, a collection of probably numbers, but it could be anything, right? But let's think numbers. And that collection of numbers has to have an addition operation that's that's closed. That is the sum of any two numbers has to remain in the set. Uh, we have to have an uh, additive identity that is some number which is acting um, like the negative of a number, right? So two plus minus two gives you zero. So minus two would be the identity of two over the integers. And you also need an additive, um, oh, you also need an additive identity. I think I switched identity and inverse here. You call the additive identity. Oh no, that's, this is correct. This is correct. Okay, so let's come up with a real example. Um, we're all familiar with the analog clock, yes? This has 12 numbers on it. Let's designate those of the numbers in our set. And what is 11 o'clock plus three hours? Two o'clock, let's just keep on the zero to 12. Okay, does that form a group? Let's go through each thing, right? Is the addition commutative? If I say three plus three, three o'clock plus two o'clock, is that the same thing as two o'clock plus three o'clock? Yeah, um, is there an additive identity? Is there something that I can add? So yeah, what's three plus 12 hours? Three. So 12 seems to be acting like a zero, right? So that's our additive identity is 12 on the clock. What about additive inverses? What do I have to add to three to make it zero or 12? Nine, right? Nine and three make 12. So the additive inverse of three on the clock is nine because three plus nine is 12, which is our zero, okay? 
Okay, so that's what a that's what a group is. Um, the associativity requirement is interesting. So why do you think we need to include that? Or what is good about including associativity? Like it, we, I know associativity means it doesn't mean how we bracket, but what, what in effect does, does that, what's the practical consequence of this? We don't bracket, right? We don't use brackets because it doesn't matter, right? However you would place the brackets on the expression, it's not gonna change the outcome of the expression. So the practical consequence of having associativity is that we don't need brackets, which, which is a good thing. That leaves the code a lot cleaner. Okay, so in addition, so we have a, a collection of items in addition, uh, and that becomes a group. If on this set of elements, we also have a associative multiplication operation, then the set also is called the monoid, right? So if you have multiplication and an inverse operation for uh, that's a monoid, and if your uh, multiplication distributes over addition in the following way, Right. If you have multiplication, if you have distribution of scalars over these sums, then the what you have left is called a ring. Right? Uh, yes, that that's a ring. Right. So if a group is a collection of numbers plus the uh, a framework for doing addition, a ring is a collection of numbers with a framework for doing multiplication. Now, does a uh, does arithmetic on the clock form a ring? Yeah, I don't see why it it wouldn't, right? Um, is there a multiplicative identity on the clock? One, right? Three times one is three. Okay, so that's fine. Um, is the zero is the is the set containing zero a ring? I don't think there's any condition that says that has to be the case. Then it is. What about the empty set? Is that a group or a ring? No, because we're saying zero exists, right? The inverse exists, right? So that can't be in the in an empty set. Uh, do the natural numbers form a group? If they do, then what do I add to three to make it zero over the naturals? You, you can't. Well, then you're changing the addition operator though, right? So you, you've changed the rules. So it was a little bit cheeky. Okay. Um, zero divisors. So this is now strange. So on the clock, if we do two times six, what do we get? Zero. Isn't that strange? I took two numbers that aren't zero and we produced the zero. This is bad, right? When you have a, a ring with zero divisors, like crazy stuff happens. Right, because zero will just starts showing up and you you didn't invite it to the party. Um, so what we want to do is ex exclude this, right? Can anyone give me another zero divisor on the clock? Three and four, are there any non-zero divisors on the clock? Yeah, seven, five, and this will be in, in well, not three. <laughs> All primes, not three and not two. <laughs> Things co-prime with 12. Yeah, that's more, that's more appropriate. Okay. Um, so some rings have zero divisors. And if we have a ring that doesn't have zero divisors, then that's called an integral domain. And those two gentlemen up there put their finger on something quite important. If I change the number of hours on the clock to a prime number, do we have zero divisors anymore? Can't, right? Because the composition of the two things that you pick would have to be equal to that prime number, which is not possible unless the th two things you picked was one in that number itself. Okay, so this is why we're going to be restricting ourselves to residues of prime characteristic, right? Because it's going to get rid of zero divisors, which are really badly behaved in, in our system. Okay, so group uh, is addition, ring gives you multiplication, integral domain says we also don't have zero divisors. So the integers form an integral domain. I can multiply over the integers and you're never gonna introduce zero unless zero was included in that product. Clock addition, uh, clock arithmetic does not form an integral domain because three times four is 12, which is which is our zero. Okay. What's the next thing that we want to do? Well, we have addition, which means we also have subtraction. We have multiplication. We also now need division. 
And to get to division, we now need to be in what we call a field. So that's a ring with some extra properties. So what is the extra property that we're going to need for a ring to also be a field? What does it mean to divide? Yes, sir. Existence of multiplicative inverses, correct. Because we don't really have subtraction, right? It's subtraction is really like adding the negative version of a number. In the same way, we really don't have division. It's what we're really doing is multiplying by the inverse. Okay, so that means if we have a multiplicative ring, in order for that to be able to provide division for us reliably, every element has to have an inverse in, in that ring. Then we can divide. So for instance, the rational numbers form a field, right? How do you get the inverse of A over B? B over A, that one's quite, quite simple. Um, Okay, so that's what we're going to be working with, right? Are, are these fields and uh, fields that come from integral domains. So basically I'm gonna give you a collection of numbers. We're gonna be able to add and multiply and divide them all always. We're never gonna pr produce zeros, right? So that's when we when I say field, you have to think of uh, like a set of numbers which, which have those properties. So the next thing I wanna talk about is the division algorithm because this is going to be the technology that like allows us to do these mods, right? When I said mod, when I said this is congruent to, I'm actually saying, oh, when you divide this by this, this is the remainder that you're going to get. So it's incumbent on us now to actually talk about how to generate those remainders. So the, the division algorithm is actually a theorem, right? And this sort of harkens back to what I was talking to yesterday about like constructional math. I, I'm asserting that if you give me two numbers, right? That are integers, and one and B is positive. If this just sort of makes it um, unique, if not, we can just switch them. If you give me A and B with B strictly greater than zero, so you're doing A divided by B, then there is a unique quotient and unique remainder um, satisfying A is equal to B times Q plus R with R strictly less than the um, size of Q, however you want to measure that. In this case, this is sort of the absolute value of this. And so everyone familiar with this? Like you, you learned this algorithm in grade school, surely, but you were not told that it was like this theorem was uh, around it. Okay, so let's let's take a look here. So if I have A is 23 and B is seven, um, this is how you generate the quotient in Julia. So remember that um, you have to sort of say slash div and then hit tab, and then you get the nice Unicode division. And if I were to execute this, you get three. Does that make sense? How many times can seven go into 23? Seven, 14, 21, 28. Oh, that's too much. So you get three. Okay. So what's the remainder then? If I can, go, if I go in, I remove 21 from 23. You, oh, and you get two, All right? So uh, this is how you get a quotient over integers. This is how you get a remainder over integers. And this should be an invariance, right? Like I'm saying that this, like the division algorithm produced numbers Q and R satisfying this relation. So this better be true. True. Perfect. Okay. How do you prove this? Yes, sir. To do division? Yeah, I think it's the opposite is true. Yeah. Yeah. I'm thinking too much like a pure mathematician. You just say how to build it. Okay, there it is. Give me two numbers, run it through this algorithm, and I'll give you Q and R with that property. And then we can go ahead and like prove that this algorithm is actually producing numbers with those properties using... Um, well, we could, we could do iteration invariance, or if we rewrote this, this one's actually recursive. So you could use an induction on this to actually prove that it, that it worked, but giving an algorithm when I'm saying something exists is a proof that it exists because I constructed it, right? Which is some, in some ways better than just saying that it exists, especially if we, if we actually want this. So this is the division or the remainder algorithm that you're 
we're all taught in grade school, except it's sort of Julia eyes. So I want to like talk about this implementation a bit. Have you seen these super type yet? Now I'm like scared that like somehow. Uh, okay, so what does this mean then? Like, why am I using a super type here? Like, what should remainder work over? Should they work over um, 8 bit integers? Should they work over 16 bit integers? 32-bit integers, 64-bit integers, arbitrarily large integers. It seems that this remainder algorithm should work over anything that behaves like an integer. That's what this is saying, right? The types that I'm expecting to come in, like A is a type T, where T is something that behaves like an integer. B is a type T, where T is something that behaves like an integer. Anyone who took the 3400 with me should be used to this, right? This is the same thing as a class instance, right? Or, or class constraint. OK, so um, this is going to save us from having to write one remainder algorithm for every single integer type in the system, which is great. OK, um, and then it's not actually that difficult um, of an algorithm to implement. So remember our sort of cheeky if statements here. Um, so you give me A, you give me B. Um, if A is less than zero, then I'm just going to negate it. it. That doesn't have an effect on the remainder and, and the quotient. Uh, otherwise, um, I'm just going to keep trying to remove as many Bs from A. I'm going to try to remove the numerator from the denominator. Which one's on top? Numerator? I'm going to try to remove from the numerator as many denominators as I can. Right? That's that's what's what's happening here. Right? So you don't have to use this remainder algorithm. It's just it's just interesting to note that like you can actually do induction on this to prove that theorem up there. It's it's maybe you should try it. Why is that task over there? I don't want this. Nope, that's the opposite. Nope, this, yes, okay. So let's see if this works. Um, so here are all the equivalent ways of doing remainders in the system, right? Here's the here's the one that we just wrote. Um, this is a built-in one, this is a built-in one, uh, and then here's the invariant. So all of these things should return to. Here are some various remainders that we can take. I'm not quite sure what was the purpose of this example, but what is the remainder if I do, um, five into 15, zero, right? Because five divides 15. What about 101 into four? Four, right? Because you can't, there, 101 goes into four zero many times. Uh, what about the remainder when four goes into 125? One, good, good mental arithmetic. Okay, zero, four, and one, right? So this is what's going to be on like the right-hand side of our uh, triple equal. So if remainder, uh, I can also have the quotient, right? I said the division algorithm produces both Q and R. You can actually do this simultaneously, but it's sort of easier just to see them as being different. Um, so here you can also generate the quotient if you want it in a, in a very similar way. Oh boy, I better get going. Um, so there are, there are the quotients and I'm just gonna walk through this list here uh, and ask for the quotients and remainder when taking 15 divided by five and four divided by 101, 125 divided by four. Um, and we should see that this identity is true in all cases, right? And remember, this is the string formatter for Julia is using this dollar sign. So I can do something like this. And we have all of these identities now. I can say 15 is three times five plus zero, four is zero times 101 plus four, 125 is 31 times four plus one. And there is a reason for this. Okay, so just remember that the percent sign is for remainder, the division sign is for quotient. If you're from Python, you may be used to this being the, the integer division operator, but in Julia, it's not, it's fractions, right? So we actually, in Julia, you do have a little bit of symbolics already built in. We are able to work with fractions. Um, we're just going to sort of ignore the fact that fractions are built in because we want to avoid using them anyways, right? That's the whole point of like using the Chinese remainder theorem. I want, I don't want to reintroduce fractions until they're absolutely necessary. So another way to express this quotient remainder relationship is by way of proper fractions. Do we have that terminology? Improper versus proper fractions. Um, so this is what we'd call an improper fraction, I guess. Or wait, is this the proper one? Now I forget. <laughs> I would never write something like this. I would write something like this. But in grade school, they said, okay, um, 23 over 7 is the same thing as 3 plus 2 sevenths. I forget which one's proper and improper. But come, this is true if and only if. If you can imagine taking the right hand, uh, taking the right hand side of that if and only if and multiplying by 7, you get this expression, right? 23 is equal to three times seven plus two, right? So that's, a, that's an alternate way of giving this quotient remainder relationship. And as you see, 
it holds true like that. Okay, so that's not overly interesting. I'm sure all of you could do division and quotients. Uh, I just wanted to do a little bit of, uh, you know, to recall all of those basic facts of arithmetic before we have to sort of make it a little bit more specific. So I got five minutes. Uh, okay, I'll just try to do as much as I can in the, in the next five minutes. So now here's a crash course in all the number theory that you need to know in order for us to do this factorization, right? So you, like the primes are super important in, in symbolic computation for reasons we, we just discussed, mostly because we're going to be able to um, have fields, right? If our set has prime characteristics. So I'm going to denote by this blackboard Z sub N, the first uh, N natural number starting from zero. Right. So these are called residue classes when addition and multiplication are done mod n. Right. So I'm saying Zn is the collection of numbers, and we're going to do addition and multiplication mod m. Right. So this is sometimes called this, this clock arithmetic. I'm going to be using this notation. Right. A is congruent to B mod C to mean that if we take A and we find its remainder on division by C, you get B. Right. So all of these statements here are equivalent. Right. A is congruent to B mod C, if and only if the remainder of A and C is B, if and only A percent sign C is equal to B. So note, you've, you've been working with this type of sort of mod N arithmetic this whole time. So you talked a little bit about overflow, right? Okay, so imagine you have the, we have an 8-bit integer, right? Two to the power of eight minus three. And then I want to add four to that. So that overflows, right? Two to the eight minus three plus four should give you one. Now we're saying that doesn't make any sense. So this happens because of overflow. But what's another way of interpreting this? We are working mod two to the power of eight, right? So that's what I do here. Right, two to the power of eight minus three plus four mod two to the power of eight is also one. So this isn't wrong, so to speak, right? It is wrong if you're expecting like the eight bit integers to, to simulate the integers proper. But if I say um, the arithmetic that you have on, on the computer isn't arithmetic over the integers, it's arithmetic mod two to the power of whatever register you're in, right? So if you have a 64 bit int, all of the bit, all of the arithmetic, including overflow, works if you just consider it to be oh mod two to the power of 60, 64. It does. Uh, it's not broken. It's just behaving like a different group, right? The group that you're not not expecting. So you may also want to use this this thing called the symmetric mod, right? So sometimes we have numbers from like zero to seven. But often it's nice to have the numbers minus three to plus three. Those are isomorphic. Like who, who really cares? It's all a matter of preference, but it's sometimes nice to include these negative numbers. So the way that you can see this is if, if you're on a clock, right? If you're at one and I want to subtract by two, you can just see like pushing that clock back, right? From two to 12 to 11. Did I do that right? Two. No, it's two to one to two. Oh, God. Let's try this again. So I have two o'clock and I'm going to subtract three. So that's two o'clock, one o'clock, 12 o'clock, 11. Okay, so that's one way that you could do it. But what's what's another way of representing uh, minus three on the clock? What's minus three on the clock? If 12 is zero, minus one is what? 11. So minus three would be 10, nine. Right. So what do I get? So I said two minus three on the clock was 11. I'm saying minus three is the same thing as nine. What's two plus nine? 11. Right. So it doesn't really matter like how we shift these numbers around. We just have to decide what, what it is that we're going to do. All right. So sometimes we'll use the mod, which means zero through N minus one. And sometimes we're going to be using the symmetric mod, which means uh, minus N half to positive and half, just so we can have some uh, numbers. So uh, another way that you can, so I'll, I'll use S mod just to designate when I'm doing this, but an easy way to convert is just to notice that seven minus two is five. And that's how you can move from like one to the other. So we don't, uh, we do not use this notation. Uh, sometimes we'll use mod or S mod when we want as there's, there's no effect on the theory or presentation. 
Okay, so let's now look at some addition tables. So here's this residue class that I defined to, why is there a five there? There should be, that should be five. Or no, that should be five, not four. Okay, so here are the first six natural numbers. Um, does this form a group with addition? Yes. Uh, how can we confirm this? So uh, does anyone know what the type of Zn is going to be here? I believe it is going to be a unit range or abstract range. Good, good job, right? So I'm saying n is six, and this is going to give me the range of numbers from zero to five. And what I'm going to do here is generate an addition table. So this is like a multiplication table, except the table forms addition, right? So I'm saying two. Oh, shoot. I got to let you guys go. Okay, so two, two plus two is four, right? That's how we uh, interpret this. And two and four make zero. What does it mean that this table is symmetric? That is, it's equal to its transpose. <laughs> it's commutative, right? So uh, because if you think about it, the thing at x, y, if it's commutative, has to be the same thing as the thing at y, x, which is the, the very definition of the of the transpose. Um, what does it mean that like some of these have zeros in them? Yeah, those are the, like, these are the terms with inverses. Do Does everything have an inverse? Yes, including, including zero. Okay, so why don't I stop there? The next thing I'm going to do is define, because um, we didn't, how far did we not make it? It's okay. It's just the timings are all a little bit different than last year. Okay, so what I want you to take from today's lecture is, okay, because I need to introduce polynomials into the system. System. And we're going to be doing arithmetic on those polynomials. And I've said, and, and I've demonstrated that we have to be super careful with like what the definition of arithmetic is, because it needs to be a ring. It needs to have inverses. It needs to not be zero divisors, right? So I'm just prepping us with the background in for the big payout, which is going to be now we have polynomials and they're at least a ring, right? And their coefficients form a field. I need to be able to say that statement and it resonate with everyone. So if um, you can get you know that there is some like alternative. We paid some fellow to give some background for this. Like there's a sequence of videos that explaining in way greater length, like groups and rings and, and, and stuff like that. So you may want to watch that before next week because it's going to ramp up the difficulty. Okay, sorry, I robbed you guys of two minutes. Um, see you next week. Oh, see, uh, there's consultation tomorrow, actually. So I'll see some of you at consultation tomorrow. Bye, chat. <laughs>